Uh, but let's start with uh, some of the improvements. Well, we, we, started the, we started the day with a fairly extensive briefing on what LG had done to improve the 2017 OLED TVs compared to the 2016s, which were already, I found this very, very um, <clears throat> strange that LG last year called their TVs perfect black, perfect color, perfect viewing angle. Um, and yet this year they made some improvements. So, and they called this year's perfect too. So <laughs> I thought, hmm, wait a second. Doesn't perfect mean can't be improved? Wait a second. <laughs> well, you know, that's funny. I, I think that the this is often the case, you know, with the uh, with any large scale manufacturer I've noticed is that the uh, marketing arm of the company is somewhat, you know, disconnected from the engineering uh, arm of the company and the development arm of the company. And so yeah, it's always know, true, you, often true. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to sell your TV, you're going to hype it up a little bit, you know, and I think that's what that's something that we do as reviewers uh, for folks is kind of sift that stuff out and get to the meat of the of the TV. And and in fact, there there were some improvements made this year. Yeah, there sure were. Uh, Robert, why don't you uh, what, what was the most important improvement to you? Uh, well, they're both related to panel performance. Number one being, I would say, coming out of black, the, the representation mm -hmm. of the darkest grays and the TV's default gamma setup is much better. They were purposely hiding last year some of the dark gray detail because there were issues in that part of the picture. And this year it is much more representative of a, a high-end display in terms of that ability to reveal that detail in the darkest scenes without elevating the black of the background or something that should be pure black. So mm -hmm. that, that was the number one thing that probably jumped off to me. That and the physical panel color, uh, that to me is as important as anything because if anybody what do you owns, mean what do you mean by that exactly when you look at any of the 2015 or any of the previous generation of lg's panels if you look at them in a well-lit room with say a letterbox movie with black bars those black bars have a glow a reddish tinge to them due to the color of the panel and it's kind of annoying there is nothing you can do about that in a room with ambient light and this year and they were they were highlighting this left and right too but there is literally no difference between real effective black in a well-lit room and the color of the panel. Uh, there is no odd suddenly, wow, there's a there's like a reddish piece of film on the front of this display. For what purpose? Uh, this time around, not only good dark detail, more appropriate for what a modern TV should be able to do, but that, that physical panel characteristic will look better in more rooms, especially well-lit rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I think uh, they called that the neutral something polarizer film or something like that something to make the blacks better in a well-lit room did you did you see that yeah uh, they picked it up at pep boys it's called window tint um <laughs> or maybe not maybe not exactly window tint but that's the effect it basically I yeah not, i think no. it it's um it's it's absorbing some of the ambient light. They did mention that that it's a lot better at re rejecting ambient light. And um yeah, like Robert said, it was a lot more neutral um, background palette, you know, from which all the other super colorful images emerged. Um, but what I noticed was um, related to that, and uh, it was really the shadow detail. Uh, specifically, you know, one of the one of their competitors used to like to put on a scene from um, um, from the last Harry Potter movie where the um, the uh, wizards are all attacking Hogwarts. And oh, on yeah. A, yeah, on on some earlier generation televisions, uh, most of that detail was lost. Um, you know, it just looked like a big br black or dark gray, you know, mush. Um, and yeah, on this TV, yeah. that scene looked great. You could p pick out individual heads, you know, standing out on the dark hillside, be uh, you know, behind it. And uh, I think really well done there. I think they took, you know, they, they listened to what we said as reviewers, what customers told them. And they, they really worked on those, those last few elements I think they needed for, um, you know, for really outstanding picture quality. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. Uh, Caleb, you must have seen also, you heard, as we all did, that they increased the brightness, the the peak brightness of OLED, and changed how it how the peak brightness varies depending on how bright the overall picture is, called APL, or average picture level. Right. I did appreciate the fact that they increased the overall brightness. Um, I think they said it was on average by 25%. 
Um, and that's where you get into the APL thing where it kind of it, it changes depending on what's happening on the screen. Uh, some of that also ties in with uh, what Dolby Vision can do, which I know we'll probably get to a little bit later. Um, yep. I definitely appreciated that uh, boost in brightness. I appreciated the finer uh, brightness controls uh, when you're trying to dial things in just where you want them. Uh, a, one notch on the brightness control uh, results in less movement uh, overall, right. uh, but the range is was maintained. So I appreciated that. Um, and I also really appreciated the fact that they had um, uh, a cinema and cinema home uh HDR preset. So um, you can get in there and make adjustments, but straight out of the box, I think this is the thing that really impressed me the most was the straight out of box settings. And we know that, um, you know, people who tend to buy super high end TVs like this may have a professional calibrator come in and make some adjustments. But uh, I think this kind of TV and indeed the less expensive OLEDs that will offer the same picture performance because it's same panel, same chipset, right? Yep. These those kind of folks, I think, are going to pull the TV out of the box and go with whatever one of the presets are. Now, some people never get off the standard mode, sadly. But um, in HDR, you've got a cinema home, which, uh, you know, optimizes HDR for a room that's got some ambient light in it. And then yep. you've got the standard cinema preset, which is great if you're watching in a dark room or if you have a, a dedicated movie theater space. Um and I and by default, this is my favorite part, by default in those HDR modes anyway, the motion smoothing circuitry is turned off. So you don't have to go in and manually find it and turn it off. Unfortunately, it's still default on for the SDR cinema setting. Uh, so you're going to have to go in and, and turn that off for all your SDR content, which we all know is the vast majority of what people are watching. But yeah, I, I felt like uh, to echo the improvement in the gradients and the dark grays, very welcome. Overall brightness increase and, and then the, the granular control that we, we get out of the TV as well. I, I really enjoyed this year. Yeah, I agree. The brightness control, by the way, does uh, set the black level of the TV. I mean, that's primarily what that control is for. And having a finer granularity, it was very coarse last year. I agree. I remember that. As you stepped one to the, you know, to 50, to 51, to 52, things changed dramatically. And here, not so much. So I, I agree. I found that really great. Um, speaking of H HDR, high dynamic range, uh, we've added the LG has added in addition to uh, HDR10, the free uh, open source uh, HDR format and Dolby Vision, uh, that which they had last year. Now, with a firmware update sometime this year, they're going to add HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma, which is probably going to be used for broadcasting, and even Technicolor's HDR system. And I've always said that I, I look at these HDR formats sort of in the same way as Dolby Digital, DTS, all the different audio formats that you can now get in an AV receiver. Uh, some people have said, oh, the, we've got another format war on our hands. What's going on? But I say no. I think as long as the TV implements them, then whatever comes in, it'll be able to handle. Uh, Robert, what do, what do you think about that? Uh, without a doubt. If, if the capability is there, it just should simply do it. In, in Specifically, though, to the case of adding Technicolor support this year, they learned something from Technicolor that went in to approve the whole line of OLED TVs uh, by partnering with them. I forget exactly what it was. It was related to H, uh, HDR playback, and it was a certain way the signal was being processed. And Technicolor had a suggestion for the right way to do it, and it turned out to be applicable for a variety of different scenarios. So hmm. just one benefit of them even expanding this coverage and to be as open as possible about these formats. Um, Another thing, too, they were also getting into the lookup tables used in these televisions in terms of determining how colors are displayed on the screen when they're being mixed. Right. And right. it's six times more detailed in terms of that lookup table compared to last year. Specifically, when I looked at things like color sweeps, be it saturation or color checker analysis, those, those default presets were below just noticeable differences. And that was... I, I hope the shipping unit, granted, everything we looked at was supposedly final product, but uh, I'm hoping when I go into somebody's home, I'm seeing similar performance carried on through there as well. But uh, even that said, there was still a little improvement to be made with the cali available calibration controls, and they mm -hmm. worked very well for both SDR and HDR now. 
including yeah, a, new, yeah. a, a new two-point setup that was unavailable last year for optimizing HDR performance, the, the That's white right. balance in particular. So. Yep, yep. I, I, I noticed that too. And we're going to get into that a little later. I actually have my uh, screenshots from, from my cow man, how, how, what I did in the calibration to show that. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about the other sort of major thing that we haven't really talked about yet, which is Dolby Atmos, which is this uh, immersive sound format uh, that puts sounds overhead as well as around you. Uh, it's in what's called an object-based format. So individual sound-emitting objects like planes or rockets or birds or whatever, as they move around, they're, the sound tracks and, and appears in whatever speakers are needed for it to appear to be overhead or to your right or whatever. And uh, another really nice thing that I think happened in the 2017 LG OLEDs is the appearance of Dolby Atmos coming out of the TV from its internal apps uh, and also being reflected or mirrored from uh, HDMI signals coming in the Dolby Atmos will come back out via HDMI ARC, or Audio Return Channel. Uh, and I think this is pretty important because Voodoo is the only, only streamer now sending Atmos, at least to the LG app. But Netflix is working on it. We should see others. And I think this is a pretty big step. Um, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's a huge step. It's not something we were able to uh, to verify and test because uh, we didn't have any gear on hand that actually would accept the uh, HDMI ARC output from the television. Right. Um, so what we saw was, you know, Dolby Atmos built into the soundbar with you know virtualization of that of that sort immersive of. sound field. Yeah, it, it, you know, I I really think that uh, the, the true Atmos experience is, is, is much better than that. So I'm really hoping that they what they talked about having um, you know, Dolby Digital Plus uh, output via HDMI ARC, carrying that Dolby Atmos soundtrack, not only from the built-in apps, as you said, like Voodoo, but hopefully pass through from things like Blu-ray players that are connected via HDMI um, uh, you know, through to the, H the ARC output. Yep. Actually, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Because I'm pretty it is sure they said it a, was. a switch. Hey, yeah. Yeah. They said it would be. I've never seen it yet. They would be the first TV to do it. So right. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope that it works. Um, and if it doesn't, I'm going to give them hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is good. But then there's the sort of flip side of the coin, which is the sound bar that, that you have to use with the TV. And we have a picture of the sound bar I want to show everybody. Uh, again, I think from Caleb at, at Digital Trends. There it is. And it's this big honking sound bar. And it's got these up-firing speakers. You can see them on either end. It's also got a couple of front-firing speakers and a couple of what LG calls subwoofers. Um, but it's I don't know about not how honking that is, Scott. It's not huge. The, the, it's sitting on top of a, a base. You know, the, the, the actual sound bar itself is only about four inches high. Maybe less, maybe well, three and a half. Well, no, but it's like 50-some inches wide. Right, true. It's almost it's, as wide as the TV. Yep. It's and big. it's super I, deep, and you can't wall mount it, and, and, correct. and. Yeah, yes, there's exactly. A lot of hands. Yep. Yep. Caleb, you were, you were saying you can't wall mount it, um, it and you have, to, you have to use it. You can't use the TV without it. Yeah, you know, I... I feel for LG a little bit here, uh, as I mentioned in my written review for Digital Trends. Uh, you know, they had a hard call to make. This is a, a revolutionary product. You know, uh, they had to make a, a kind of a big decision. Are we going to put all of the guts, the power supply, the switching, the input jacks, all that good stuff in a black box that would, yeah, all the processing, everything that you would normally put in the TV, which creates the big bump out that you see on all the other OLEDs that we've seen up until now. If if you're going to have to pull them out of the display itself, you got to put them somewhere. And yes, they could have put them in a black box, uh, something like the cable box or Blu-ray player that you stick in your entertainment system. But then there would be no audio right now. Yes, I think we've all made the argument that most folks investing this much money, $8,000 on a 65 inch wallpaper OLED are probably going to have a pretty fancy sound system to go with it. But you know very well that they would have caught a lot of heat if they didn't put speakers, uh, you know, with this in some way. So I feel like first time out uh, with a TV like this, they decided to stick it in a soundbar. It probably made the most sense to them. With that said, I'm a little bit, uh, 
yeah, I mean, I'm disappointed that you have to have this big bulky thing and that you can't really get rid of it. Um, and it's a good thing that they did enable Dolby Atmos uh, pass through from HDMI because there'd be no way to pass that onto your home theater system. Otherwise, it is the hub. It's what everything get pl gets plugged into. Um, I am also a little disappointed that it's not true Dolby Atmos. Those top firing drivers could have been configured to shoot up at an angle and be, you know, producing discrete Atmos your, information. Your um, overhead channels in Atmos. Yeah, they don't exactly. do that. No, they don't. It's a virtual deal. Um, but that decision may be tied to the fact that they they had other kind of virtualization and processing that they wanted to fold in. Um, you know, I think they were worried about having the the there be kind of a disconnect between the panel and the sound source, um, which is funny because, you know, a lot of people deal with that when they have a dedicated center channel speaker placed, you know, two, three feet below their TV. Um, you know, so they had some tough choices to make. Um, I think that, you know, they've heard enough at this point from all the <laughs> comments that they're seeing online that, yes, they should probably offer a version with a black box. And I honestly would be shocked if we didn't see that next year.